Let's see all the breakfast in Plus TV Africa. We're looking at the new NNPC as it's been unveiled by the president. Uh, we have an economist who joins the conversation, Gospel Billy. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Well, a bit of a background to it. 44 years after inaugurating the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, that's the NNPC in 1977, as the uh, Cornell in the Nigerian Army and Minister of Petroleum Resources. President Mohamed Buhari again has unveiled the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, the NNPCL, an exercise which sees the NNPC officially transiting to a limited liability entity in line with the provision of the Petroleum Industry Act, that's the PIA, with a change in structure and the company would be regulated in line with the provision of companies and allied matters act, that's the Commer, and in PC Limited will operate as a commercial independent and viable national oil company at par with its peer around the world to sustainably drive and deliver to value to over 200 million shareholders and a global energy community while adhering to its fundamental corporate values of integrity, excellence, sustainability. Meanwhile, the country's oil and gas industry lost about $50 billion worth of investment. Uh, that's between 2015 and 2019, according to the report. Uh, states that 4% of $70 billion investment inflow into African uh, Africa's oil and gas industry came to Nigeria, even though the country is the continent's biggest producer and largest uh, reserves. Well, Gospel Obele, an economist, joins the conversation. Once again, thank you for being part of the show. Thank you for having me. Good morning. So let's start on this note. What do you make of this development? Uh, well, um, the, the perspective is actually to enable um, the PIB get correctly implemented and um, also within the context of changing realities in the oil and gas sector. Uh, we've seen that there have been critical changes happening recently in the global oil and gas industry. And um, from top of mind, it makes sense for the institution to also evolve in its um, in its brand and its processes to also uh, identify with these changes as well. Okay, I remember still looking at it now. Uh, the question that a lot of persons have asked is, what does this mean to the uh, industry, the petroleum industry, and what does this really mean in, in real time to Nigerians? Well, um, we'll know subsequently as time will, um, as, as time goes by, because it's a developing story. Um, the conversation basically is if really the industry fundamentals would also evolve with the change. It's one thing to brand and institutions and that thing for the institution to take a new um, level of um, leadership, governance, process and improvement. So that's a different conversation entirely. So. Um, maybe by the next six months, we'll be able to tell exactly from an assessment point of view if the the details within the institution have also evolved within the context of this change as well. So, but but there's, there's also been some concern. But uh, I I want you to also talk about it in a layman's language. You know, the fact that uh, we're getting to understand that hey, there's a new NNPC, a new identity and all that's going on. What can one understand? I mean, in, in common terms, what does this really mean? What it simply means that the, the, the government is just seeking for new ways to execute the Petroleum Industry Act, which would mean deregulating the sector, getting more people to play in the oil and gas industry, ensuring that uh, major reforms or major changes can be, can be well executed in the industry, and um, also making sure that the quote-unquote oil side of the Nigerian economy can really develop for what it is. I mean, being the fact that we have about six refineries, um, there are conversations on how to position the production states to become more relevant within the mix and all of that. So uh, taking up that holistic reform uh, would also need some form of um, institutional cleansing 
However, uh, we, the concern is if a rebranded NPC will be equated to Islam, we so don't know. So, so would you say that you know, with a rebranded NPC, that the issue of uh, not functional refineries would be a thing of the past? Does that take care of the problem that we will be able to refine our crude and uh, don't have to import it after exporting it? It doesn't take care of the problem. Um, even if you do not rebrand the NMPC, these are reforms that must happen. It has nothing to do with rebranding or reunveiling a new NMPC and all that. You know, reforms, uh, refinery reforms and all of that are a function of government, governance, fiscal policy, you know, and all of the stakeholders, you know, that have different vested interests in enabling that to happen. So until there's some form of agreement on the table, to enable that to happen, uh, we may not see the light of day then. You can still uh, reform an NPC, sorry, you can still unveil a new NPC, and the refineries are, re are still dead. Uh, you can still unveil a new NPC, and we are still struggling with subsidies, struggling with oil receipts, struggling with um, um, uh, uh, crude oil processing and all that. So it doesn't in any way mean that, you know, the right institutional reform to also happen. Um, institutional reforms are also largely a function of the level of governance, the quality of improvement, leadership, and you know if the stakeholders are willing to make that vision come to happen. So there are two different uh, things, ideally. So what what then is exciting about you know the unveiling of uh, a new NNPC, the identity and and the change that we have really experienced as at yesterday you know, officially, what then is, should be exciting or is exciting about it? I mean, the concept of um, institutional change, um, redefinition and all that is to help the identity, to help the perception, to help the storytelling and to help possibly, you know, sell government in a new light, which is also very, very critical um, as a first level to reforms. You know, or one of the things you need to do when you are actually trying to reform an institution or you reform a practice. So, aside from ensuring that the culture and the practices internally or the governance and processes and all that are improved, you also want to define the image and all that. So, but my own my worry about this, it looks as if we are putting the cat before the horse because. We haven't really, really dealt with the core reform blocks. And the conversation is how would a new NPC enable the required reforms, one, and two, the ease of implementing the PIB or executing the PIB. So those are the real conversations that need to start happening. But then again, um, unveiling a new institution or a new identity institution is part of the reform process in terms of uh, it's an opportunity or a window for government to recommit stance towards reforms and growth. Mm. Well, so let's let's talk about some of the issues, just like you have mentioned now. Uh, some of the issues and concerns that have been raised uh, by different stakeholders and you know Nigerians generally is that it's more like having uh, an old wine in an old skin. There's really nothing new, like. It's almost one and the same thing. And the question now is, being a commercial entity, is it possible for the company to source its own enterprise or experts, expertise, uh, consultants, you know, staff, without the interference of the government, which is usually hinged on ethnicity, tribe, and what have you? We know that the government is still a public, you know, is still tied, you know, to the government, despite the fact that it's been commercialized. But how do we achieve all of this? Because we know that uh, you still have the same persons running the business. I mean, same uh, government workers, just the same as you have with the NNPC. So w what difference does this really make? And in, in all of this, is there a possibility that it has the capacity to go ahead to act, you know, in this light. Yes, that's the expectation. I mean, what you have is um, for institutions that have been commercialized, you know, and probably branded in that order, majority of the internal processes may not really change 
but the expectation is that this church should be more open to doing business, especially in terms of engaging private sector and international uh, players as it were. Um, if that happens, um, large enough, um, we can say, I mean, consultants and all of the required strategy and innovation work will need to happen. But then again, the, the only nuance to this story that it's a bit um, unclear is the fact that it's oil and gas. And um, 80% of the, of, of the current foreign exchange receipts or foreign receipts come from that sector. So there are still deep level vested interests. There are still deep level um, um, concerns about many things, especially how the PIA will be executed. So even if, yes, the NNPC may seem to have been rebranded, but because of the level of bias and the weight of vested interest in the institution, some things may still largely remain. So I agree with you when it's um, the commission of old wine, old skin, and all of that conversation. But uh, the expectation is that the church should be able to evolve into um, newer levels of um, engagement and execution of the PIA. But some people have actually expressed their doubts in this. And you have not sound different from those who have said this. For instance, you have NEPA. People say you have, you know, uh, some commercial ventures or what have you, but there's really nothing to show, show forth or there's nothing to talk about. It's one and the same thing. So it feels like we're going in circles. Or in circle. Yes, please. I mean, anybody who has paid attention to how institutions evolve in Nigeria um, shouldn't expect so much because, I mean, if you notice very well, this is just, even if you look at power or energy, for instance, it's also an institution that is heavily invested, you know, by different stakeholders. You know, once it's an institution that contributes heavily or holds the potential to contribute heavily to an economy, there are deep vested interests or deep powers that control the outcomes. So even when you switch the in court structure, it's still the same narrative. So I wouldn't also expect much from the new NNPC. Um, except to begin to see critical change. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that it's a developing story. Um, we hope that the required innovation and the required new process or new ways of doing things will be introduced over time. But I hardly doubt that fact because it's a highly vested institution. So decisions will be largely influenced by the key stakeholder interests in the sector. But then again, let's not get it wrong. Stakeholder interests can come together for uh, for the better good of things. However, the better good of things can be now relative, it's a different conversation if it will be inclusive enough in its outcome. Now, um, we know that the NNPC has like 49% uh, shares in the L NLNG, and now that's been commercialized, is expected to pay uh, only tax to the federal government, who takes, you know, 39% dividends from the NLNG annually? Well, that we're not clear yet because um, there are other institutions that um, are, are invested within the structure of the NLNG. I also think that this is part of what will be evolving as we move into the execution of the rollout of this new um, initiative as it were, or the new NNPC. So there's still so many blind spots, which is why I started by saying that in sectors where you have high level vested interest because of the role they play in the economy, uh, you don't expect very clear outcomes at the initial state of things, all right? As you evolve into uh, the execution of that initiative, then we can expect some clarity. But even at that, clarity is a function of what um, stakeholders want you to know. So for now, we can't really, really decipher the entire structure of remittance because even if you say, okay, um, an NPC is not a commercial entity. Somehow, somewhere in, in some part of the structure and the dealings, it still remits money to government. Yes, the, 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 the conversation out there will be taxes, but if you know how economies and institutions work, especially highly invested institutions, it cannot just be taxes. But then again, it's a developing story. Well, uh, I, I like the fact that you constantly say it's a developing story, but it looks as if we're going to be dealing with the issue of tax evasion we're also going to be dealing, you know, with the issue of lack of accountability because right now we can't really ascertain where the 39% uh, would be going to interest at the end of the day, especially with the, uh, you know, the fact that 
the NMPC has a share with the LNNG. That's if I got the acronym correctly. So where does this leave us? Should we be excited about this? These are questions that a lot of persons are asking. And we're also asking right here, and you are not very um, sure about it. But also, right now, what happens with subsidy? Taxpayer will continue to pay taxes. Uh, would there be subsidy? We're looking about four trillion naira for subsidy. Does this even make sense in the midst of this? All right, the, the conversation on subsidy has evolved from an economic slash safety net initiative to a political slash political correctness conversation. And what I mean is, I mean, subsidy should, should have been taken out a long time ago, right? But you have the back and forth around the first cast in the midst of things. You know, they just they don't they're not just ready to take out the subsidy. And the conversation is this. When you take out the subsidy, the cost of living will hike and it will impact on inflation. And it's also worsen the state of things currently in the country. So that's a major concern um, for the political actors because it doesn't make them politically correct. So now so, so that's that's the, and do not forget that we're in a pre-election year, you know. So um the bane of the subsidy conversation is that it is not really the conversation because if you fix power you won't have any reason to be discussing subsidy in the first place and that's because a critical chunk of the majority of those who consume pms are primarily households and businesses you know and that means that if you fix power households and businesses will be less dependent on pms and you won't have to regulate or you have so much pressure on the demand side outweighing the supply side. All right, so uh, that, and that's the concept that also informs subsidy. So instead of fixing the structural issue here, which is power or energy, um, they introduce initiatives to sort of like distract and, you know, keep buying time and all that. So the subsidy has to be taken out, but probably it will be taken out in phases, but even the government may not want to take it out now because it may bother heavily on the political correctness of the season and all of that. So it's it's a very dicey conversation. And I don't think it's something that the institutions are really, really considering within the context of all of these uh, changes that are happening, yeah. I, I really don't know how dicey that is, especially where, you know, four trillionaire has been budgeted for subsidy in 2022, and it would be from taxpayers' money. And some people say that, the NNPC has been sold to friends and cronies. Do you think that that's, it? that's the case? And don't you think that all of this is just a sham at the end of the day? Of course, the subsidy is not a real, 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 100% real conversation. It's also a very relative argument because the con who are you really subsidizing for? That's the first thing. Um, secondly, we've also, seen, uh, we've also seen that the price of fuel has also increased slightly over time, plus the fact that scarcity has been involved in the conversation. That's to show you that there's something else going on in the background, you know, and all that. But then again, if the subsidy is being exposed to market prices, that means demand and supply side should determine what the price is, there will be so much pressure on the average engineer. So it's not really a clear conversation because there are many institutional vested interests around that conversation. But like I mentioned earlier, subsidy is only a distraction if really we choose to do what is right, which is fixing the structural issues around power, energy inclusion, and the likes. Yeah. Hmm. So, but um, uh, we also look at another thing also that's been making the rounds is the fact that prior to this time, it feels like with the activities going on, we have, uh, first of all, scarcity of the product, this petroleum product. And at the end of the day, uh, we also, there's also another issue of controversy surrounding the pricing, where there seemed to be an increase from 165 naira per litre. We're looking at 170 naira per litre to about uh, 190 naira. Now, and it's dependent on where you're located, so the price seem to vary across the entire country. 
one would think that uh, all with the unveiling of uh, the NNPC that these are things that you should sort out. I mean, these are practical things that Nigerians are looking uh, at. Should this not solve uh, the major concerns? Should be a fixed price, or the product should actually price of the product should be reduced, and life should be smooth for the people. I mean, the fact that the, the, the fact that the price is not fixed is to show you how volatile that sector is. And it should show you that the real problem is in the inability to correctly govern the value chain. And that's, we can also correctly govern the value chain when you're not in control of the outcomes, meaning that you export to new raw materials. When these things are imported, re-imported back to you, um, they are imported as finished goods, and you need to buy them afresh, spend new monies buying them. You know, so um, the pressure of subsidy plus the value chain cost, plus the fact that there are a lot of vested interests, um, has been such that the government and the stakeholders have been unable to correctly manage all that. And what we are now seeing is that prices are permeating in different states, all right? And the same product is being sold at different prices in different states. So you are reinforcing inflation at a different level, especially at state level now, you know, and, and all that. So it's something that relatively has come to stay if the right actions are not taken by institutions to solve them. And I don't think this rebranding would bring any critical solution to the table because, I mean, if it was about solution and reforms, that would have happened regardless of whatever institutional branding that we will be engaging at the moment. And I think that's more critical right now for Nigerians Gosling, than the rebranding. Just before we let you go now, you're an economist. Can you quickly tell us what you think should be, you know, the solution to the oil and gas industry, especially that we're highly dependent on this sector for our earnings and survival as a country? So there are two perspectives in, um, in, from my angle. Um, number one would be to galvanize, I mean, pull all stakeholders together and find a, a, a middle point of interest because without the stakeholders you cannot cause a level of reform so pull the stakeholders and agree at a level of interest what the common good will be and within the context of the common good everybody has a stake on inside you know so so until we reach that level we cannot begin to roll out reforms and that's because whatever reforms you throw out to the table that is not for the common good all right, that reform will be at the mercy of the stakeholders at the end of the day. Um, on the other end of things, to reduce the pressure on the oil and gas industry, you fix power. When you fix power, there will be less demand pressure. So the reason why you can talk about subsidy, you can talk about the fact that prices are going high in different states at different locations, is because there is a high demand and a high dependency on the product or on the sector. So if you relax the pressure, or the dependency level on this sector, you now realize that um, demand will drop and then you can clearly think of reforms and all of that. And the reason why you have a lot of stakeholders interest involved is because a lot of Nigerians and literally everything you do in Nigeria is hinged on energy. And energy right now is hinged only to oil and gas. You know, so you don't have stable power supply, people need to go to the train stations. So once you take that out of the equation, it would mean that there'll be less dependency on the oil and gas uh, block of the energy um, uh, need and all of that. So I think the government needs to do, think of it on both ends, right? Find the common ground for stakeholders to cause the required reform, as well as look at critical ways to begin to fix power so there's less dependent on the sector. Well, thank you so much uh, for being part of the show this morning, Gospel. Thank you for having me. Really. Well, we've been looking at, you know, everything about the NNPC that's been unveiled, the new NNPC, and what it holds for Nigerians, and what it really, really, really means, and uh, the fact that a lot of persons have been on the positive, others have been on the other side of the divide. Uh, we've probably heard from the economists, but we're hoping that, you know, government, at the end of the day, will be acting uh, on the interest. I mean, at the end of the day, would be the interest, the interest of the people, 
and that's what it is. But fingers crossed, let's see how all of this pans out. Uh, there's a size of it this morning on the first topic. We take a break when we return. We'll be looking at the fact that the president has given uh, the Minister of Education and an ultimatum to end the strike. Stay with us. <laughs> 